right, I think we're starting to experience the real, uh, real analysis difficulties, right, to some extent. It's sort of a matter of uh, this game you got to play with these proofs, which seem like they should be obvious, but they're not obvious, right? They, they seem like they should be easy. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so with our homework, mm -hmm. sometimes taking like three or four hours, mm -hmm. Plus, than having completion and chapter, mm -hmm. or like the test. What do you consider, like, especially if we're taking quite a bit of credits and just all can't get done in the amount of time we have? So, like, what, what would you consider as far as, like, like do, you, do some students just do, like, all the completion at the end? If, um, like, if the you should try to already? avoid that. Yeah, I mean, it does take like, a long time, especially when you were starting to get going. I think even though the topics get a little harder later on, I think perhaps you start to get used to it enough that you can probably go faster. As far as exams go, and, and again, after chapter two, you only have to do about half the completion problems. But I think it's important for these first couple chapters to handle. all. Um, but yeah, some people rush at the end and just try to fill in their, um, their what's the word? The journal. Uh, in a rush at the end, but that's not ideal for your learning. So you do as well as you can uh, to do it as you read and learn with those time constraints as much as you can. Um, the I, I think I did do, should mention about the test that uh, they are closed book, closed notes, uh, no calculators, and uh, at least for the first three exams, there's going to be a there'll be an open notes portion of the final. But for the first main midterm exams, it's all closed things. Part of the grade will be based on just stating definitions and theorem statements, perhaps, and true-false questions, perhaps, too. Um, maybe a calculation or two, and then part of it on proofs. And if you look at those old exams, you'll see what kind of proportions of points I gave for those things. And yeah, those old exams uh, you can look at are a little different from each other, but. Um, there are a lot of similarities too. There, there are things that I pretty much put on every exam every time. Okay, though I might state them slightly differently. All right, let's come look at mathematics here. Again, in real analysis is kind of full of these crazy examples to remember that are there as sort of a source of counterexamples, which you know, counterexamples are meant to falsify a conjecture that you might have. Things can get crazy here. Here's a crazy function. Actually, I need to update this to look nicer. Here's just a second. That I did that in the last lecture since. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> Take a moment to think about this function. It's a piecewise function. Piecewise functions are fine. Okay, they are functions. There's no shame in writing a formula as a piecewise function, like on the assignment there with the one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between z and n. You want the output to equal one if x is rational, and equal zero if x is irrational. R minus q is the irrational numbers. If the complement of the rationals in the reals, I could use the complement notation. That's what that's meant to be there. C of Q is the complement of Q. What can you say about this function? Can you draw its graph? Does this fun function have a limit anywhere? Is it ever continuous? Can you differentiate it? Can you integrate it? Do these questions even make sense? Can you imagine this function? What, what does it do? Go up and down constantly somehow? Should you try to connect the dots? What do you think? Do you think you should try to connect the dots? No, don't try to connect the dots. Can it be drawn? Well, sort of. In your imagination, mostly. You can know, draw a bunch of dots like that and a bunch of dots like that. It's not really the graph. It's sort of a pseudograph augmented with your imagination to try to imagine the outputs being one for every rational input and being zero for every irrational input. 
Does it seem like it should be continuous anywhere? It doesn't seem like it. And that's right. This function is nowhere continuous. Does it have a limit anywhere? No, because if it's not continuous, it's not going to have a limit anywhere. It's, it's nowhere continuous. Well, okay. It doesn't have a limit anywhere. Can't differentiate it. Could you integrate it? That's a harder question, perhaps. Do you think you could integrate this function? Less clear whether that should be yes or no, I think. I think it's got area under it between arbitrary number A and an arbitrary number B. Well, the answer is it depends. So this, this question about the integral. I guess I integrated from 0 to 1. The answer is it depends. If you use the Riemann integral, as we will do in chapter 5, and as you learned a little bit about in calculus, it's, it can't be integrated. You say it's not Riemann integrable. And we will prove that. It's actually pretty easy to prove. Um, but if you do something called Lebesgue integration, and here's how you spell Lebesgue. It's not Lebesgue, as far as I know. I always hear people pronounce it Lebesgue. If you do Lebesgue integration, which is a different kind of an integral, how can it be a different kind of integral? Um, it is integrable. It is Lebesgue integrable. And over this integral from 0 to 1, its integral is 0, actually. Which sort of makes some intuitive sense if you think about the fact that the irrationals are uncountable and the rationals are countable. That's no proof that it's Lebesgue integrable and the answer is 0, but sort of makes some intuitive sense. You know, there's many more irrationals somehow than there are rationals, even though given any two real numbers, no matter how close together, there's infinitely many rationals and infinitely many irrationals between them. In spite of that fact, there's still somehow more irrationals than rationals. It just blows the mind. So that's some intuitive justification for why the integral might be zero. Actually, if you switch it around, if you make the outputs one, for all irrationals and zero for all rationals, then the integral is one over this interval, and you know, it's really, it's really a, the area of a square. If it's one for all irrationals and zero for all rationals, the integral from zero to one actually is one, the Lebesgue integral, not the Riemann integral. Weird. Okay. We do the Riemann integral integral in here. Did it in calculus. If you go to grad school in math, you'll learn about the Lebesgue integral. Okay. We actually did some, have somebody five, six years ago did their Foundations of Math project about the Lebesgue integral. It's pretty tough, but if you're there for a challenge, you can give that a try. Here's a, an even crazier function, you might say. Zoom in on this one. f of x equals x if x is rational and negative x is, if x is irrational. So somehow the graph is like an x. Well, OK, again, it's equal to x when x is rational and negative x when x is irrational. So somehow you've got these scattered points jumping up and down again. You can only sort of imagine it. That actually is continuous at one point. Which point would it be continuous at? At one point. That's a function. If you ever want to come up with an example of a function that's continuous at one point, this is the best example to come up with. Simplest. What one point would this be continuous? Zero. Zero. Yeah, that's sort of where the two dotted graphs meet. But continuous at that one point doesn't mean you can draw it without picking up a pencil. But by the definition of continuity, it can be shown that that's continuous at one, that one point. Um, we haven't proved the Archimedean property. I mentioned it, and here is something you should know. I do think it's personally, personally very interesting that if you take this axiomatic approach where we have, we know what a field is, we know what an ordered field is, that just those axioms are not enough to prove this, even though the rationals do satisfy this property. They are an ordered field. 
they satisfy this property because they are real numbers, it takes the completeness axiom to prove this if you only use those axioms that we have. Perhaps if you use other axioms that don't include the completeness property, maybe it's possible to prove this about the rationals. But for us, if you look at the proof of the, of the Archimedean property in the book, they use the completeness axiom. I'm not going to go over that proof, but I do want you to know, again, the following statements are equivalent. They, they mean the same thing, and since one of them is true, they're all true. The one the book proves is true initially is choice one here. Any one of these can be thought of as being the Archimedean property because they're all equivalent. Actually, the one that we'll use the most often is this last one. You might, might want to make a note of that in your book or something. Property four is the one we'll use the most often. Give me any positive real number. There is a positive integer n such that one over n is less than that positive real number. No matter how close that number is to zero. There's actually, things get really weird in math when you go to grad school. So if you like weird stuff and you like math, maybe math grad school is for you. You can actually, you know, you've heard of real numbers, rational numbers, real numbers, complex numbers. Um, there's also something called, I think I got the name right, the ultra real number system. Or maybe it's the hyper real system. Let's look up the hyper reals. Come on. We are so impatient these days when things are slow. Come on. Here we go. Hyper real. Not hyper realism. Oh, come on. <laughs> Autocomplete. Hyper real. It's not hyper reality. Hyper real numbers. There we go. Hyper real numbers from Math World or Wikipedia. And hyper real hyper real analysis. Wouldn't you like to take that class? Sure. The system of hyperreal numbers is a way of treating infinite and infinitesimal quantities where the Archimedean property doesn't necessarily hold. Give me a positive hyperreal number, there's not necessarily an integer such that 1 over n is less than that positive hyperreal number. Maybe because that positive hyperreal number is somehow infinitesimally small. What? Okay, we're not learning hyperreal analysis. Okay, but I will allude to it from time to time. The idea of an infinitesimally small quantity is an intuitive concept that was treated in a non-rigorous way back when Newton and Leibniz first created calculus. And only in the past century or so has become more rigorous. This could all be foundations of math projects. I don't know. I looked at, I looked at a book about hyperreal numbers once, and I didn't look at it for very long. Fortunately, I didn't have to take a class on it in graduate school. Okay, but for us, for the real number system, this is definitely true. That's the most useful form of the Archimedean property for us. Give me any positive number x, I can find an integer, a positive integer n. Focus on the integer, such that 1 over n is less than x. We'll, we will use that a lot starting in chapter 2, starting maybe even today. So we're going to start chapter 2 today. So you should know that. What do you need to know about cardinality? Well, you should know the definition of cardinality. Two sets have the same cardinality. I wrote it on the board. If there's a one-to-one -one and on-to mapping from one set to the other, a bijection, I called it, you don't need to know the word bijection. Okay, I'm just letting you know bijection means one-to-one -one and on-to. So that's the definition of cardinality. Some basic theorems that are in the book. Perhaps the most surprising of which, and also the most confusing of which as far as how you state it, is the fact that a countable union of countable sets is countable. You gotta make sure you don't misunderstand the statement. I'll say it again. I probably should write it. A countable union 
of countable sets is countable. Three uses of the word countable in the same sentence there. This is a theorem that's proved in the book. I'm not going to prove it in here. But you should understand what it means, how to interpret it correctly. Don't misunderstand this key thing. By countable, but again, countable means either finite or countably infinite, one or the other. It suffices to do this for countably in infinite collections, actually. Um, a countably union means you've got a union of a countable number of sets. You've got a union of a countable number of sets. Countable, again, means either finite or countably infinite. Again, let's go ahead and, for the sake of simplicity, assume it's a countably infinite collection. Travis, you look like you have a question. Um, so the cardinality you mentioned, the one-to-one -one and onto? Yep. Okay. Two sets have the same cardinality. If there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, the book calls it, between them, that means one-to-one -one and onto. Okay. There's a function that's one-to-one -one and onto. You can have one to the other, not just one-to-one. -one. Um, you've got a countable collection of sets. Let's assume it's countably infinite. In other words, you can write the union in this kind of notation, which really means this. You can list the sets out. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence here between the sets and the natural numbers specified by the subscript. The function that would map the natural numbers to this collection of sets would take the number one and map it to A1, the number two and map it to A2, and the number three and map it to A3. Whenever you have a countably infinite collection of something, you can use subscripts in this way to enumerate them. So this countable union means you've got a countable collection of sets that you're taking the union of. What does this union mean? It's just a collection of all points, all points x such that x is an ai for some i goes from 1 to infinity for some i. That's what that union is. The second thing, the second use of the word countable here is a countable set. That means each of these A's is a countable set. For each one of these A's, there is a one-to-one -one and on-to mapping from the natural numbers to that set, meaning each one of these is a countable set. I'm, again, assuming countable infinite, really. The conclusion is the resulting set, this union, is a countable set. There's a one-to-one -one and onto mapping from the natural numbers to this set. So this collection is a countable collection. You are doing a countable union of those, meaning a union of that countable collection. Each of these sets is a countable set. The resulting union is a countable set. So the key thing here is to not misinterpret what that means. Set of rationals is countably infinite. The field of rational numbers, somewhat surprisingly, perhaps. Again, this is somewhat counterintuitive, even though on the number line, give me any two real numbers, no matter how close, there's infinitely many rationals between them. They could be 10 to the negative million apart, and there's still infinitely many rationals between them. But still, the rationals are countably infinite set. And that spiraling diagram was supposed to convince you. It's not a proof, but it's supposed to be convincing. Yet somehow, R is uncountable, which ends up meaning the set of irrationals is uncountable as well. Because if the set of irrationals were countable, then the union of the rationals and the irrationals would be the reals, which would then be countable, which is not the case. I outlined Cantor's diagonalization argument last time. I didn't, there wasn't a rigorous proof. Just outlined the idea. There are plenty of relatively short videos out there that go through that proof in more detail than I did, actually. 
that it's an uncountable set. There's no one-to-one -one onto correspondence between that set, the reals, and the natural numbers. It's a bigger size of infinity set. That's pretty amazing. And again, so between any two real numbers, there's infinitely many rationals and infinitely uh, many irrationals, yet somehow there's more irrationals than rationals. It's a bigger size of infinity. Just blows the mind. And yeah, because that the set of irrationals is uncountable too. So you should know these facts. You should also know the book's proof of this. Although they prove something simpler, they prove that the interval between 0 and 1 is uncountable, which then implies that the set of real numbers is uncountable. It's actually, I, I think, a pretty relatively easy proof, even though it's kind of long. Draw a picture. What gives you a picture, actually? It's a very reasonable looking thing. Where is the completeness axiom used? You should know that when you look at that proof. Essentially, you have to define a super and end in the course of that proof, and that's where the completeness axiom is used, so that you have a certain amount. Essentially, that proof is related to another fact that I think is worth mentioning right now, and is proved in chapter two. If you have what's called a, uh, a collection of nested intervals, like comes up in that proof, um, A1, B1 being your first closed interval, I should say. A2, B2 being the next closed interval, and that's inside of this one. I'm going to put the subset thing the opposite direction there. Is that okay? You're okay with that? So these intervals keep getting, well, smaller than or equal to the preceding interval. They are nested inside each other. Like this is possible for A2, for example, to equal A3, but for B3 to be different, because I have the inclusion here being possibly equal to with the line there, etc. The intersection of all these sets is a countable intersection. Is non-empty. There's at least one point in the intersection of all of those. Essentially, the proof that R is uncountable, the book uses that fact. It's actually not true of the rationals. If you only consider rational numbers as endpoints of your intervals, and for example, if your intervals happen to be, I, I'm, I'm not going to ignore the irrationals here, happen to be intervals of this form, But I'm intersecting those with the rationals each time. So I'm only considering rational numbers in those intervals. Consider the intersection of all these intervals as n goes to infinity. There is one point in the intersection that's the square root of 2, but square root of 2 is not rational. So if you only consider the rationals, if you always intersect those with q in particular, actually with doing that, that guarantees the intersection of all these things is in fact the empty set because I'm intersecting each of these things with the rational, so I'm only considering rational numbers in them. But I made the midpoint of all these things be an irrational number as a way of guaranteeing that this intersection is empty. You should know as part of your mathematical education that Cantor, first of all, was the first person to think of these ideas okay, about cardinality. And he wondered, is there a cardinality between the cardinality of the natural numbers and the cardinality of the reals? Use this notation. The cardinality of the reals is strictly greater than the cardinality of the naturals. There's certainly a a one-to-one -one function from n to r. Map every natural number to itself, in particular. But there's no one-to-one -one and on-onto function from n to r. There's no onto function at all. 
that ends up being the cardinality of the reals is bigger than the cardinality of the natural numbers. This, these things have names. Again, this, thing, this is called um, aleph naught. Sort of looks like this. And this is most commonly called c. Not the speed of light, but the cardinality of the continuum. And these, call, or these are called cardinal numbers. And you can do a whole kind of arithmetic of cardinal numbers. They're infinite cardinals, somehow bigger than all the natural numbers. Um, he wondered, is there a cardinality between these two things? The continuum hypothesis, which, I don't know, maybe he went to the grave believing it was true, is that there is no cardinality. At various points in his life, he thought he had proved the continuum hypothesis or disproved it, but then errors were found. But there's no cardinalities between these, meaning there's no set whose cardinality is strictly bigger than this and strictly less than that. But the answer to the continuum hypothesis is surprising. Continuum hypothesis is actually with, within our standard axiomatic system here. It's neither true nor false. It's independent of uh, what's called zermelo frankel set theory, okay? which we are not really getting into. It's, it's a more foundational kind of axiomatic system. Um, it's independent of it. You can't prove it's true, you can't prove it's false. And people have proved you can't prove it's true and you can't prove it's false. So what does that mean? It means you can take it as an axiom or not. It's negation you can take as an axiom. You can, you're free to do either thing. You can assume as part of the axiomatic system that there is no cardinality between those, which actually is what standard mathematicians do, so to speak, is to assume the continuum hypothesis is true as an axiom. Or you could try assuming it's not true. There is a cardinality between them. I don't know how you'd really do that, though. I mean, you assume it's true without actually coming up with a particular set where it holds. That seems weird to me. I think it seems weird to most mathematicians. So most mathematicians take the continuum hypothesis as an axiom. Okay? This is all part of your math major education here, just knowing about these things. Not that you necessarily investigate them further. But if, if it interests you, you wonder why, maybe you do investigate it further. Maybe you have the foundations of math. Do you know who's teaching that class? Um, I'm forgetting. It's probably either Turnquist, Wetzel, or Eric Gossett. It's one of those three. There's also that ultimate paradox that I introduced to you yesterday. Or not yesterday, but two days ago. There's infinitely many sizes of infinity. Not just two. There's not just two infinite cardinals. There's infinitely many. Anybody watch those Vsauce videos at all? That extension? Oh, you gotta watch them. They're great. <laughs> Anybody ever watch Vsauce videos? See a couple? Okay. They're great. I, I love those videos. The guy in. The video is his name, Michael, he said. He always says, hey, Vsauce, Vsauce, Michael here. I guess I'm not sure what Vsauce really means. But anyway, um, there's infinitely many sizes of infinity because for any set, and this is something Cantor discovered, any set whatsoever, its power set, P of S, has a strictly greater cardinality. And if, it's, if S is an infinite set to begin with, whether it's countably infinite or uncountably infinite, it doesn't matter its power set is still going to have a strictly bigger cardinality. There's going to be no 1 to 1 and 2 function from S to its power set. Who remembers what a power set is? 
Taylor. It's the set of sets. The set of all subsets of the given set. Sets. Yeah. P of S is the set of all column A uh, such that A is a subset of S. The elements of any power set are themselves sets. And you can always keep going with power sets. You can take the power set of the power set of X. Uh, consider a simple example. What if S were the set A, B, C, an element of the power set, an example of an element of the power set would be the set A comma B. This would be an element of the power set of X. So would the empty set, so would the entire set itself, so would the set, the singleton consisting of a single element, those are all elements of the power set of S. They are subsets of S. What do elements of the power set of the power set look like? Well, for example, the set consisting of the set consisting of A comma B and A. That set would be an element of the power set of the power set of S. So is there some relation between the sizes as we Yeah, they keep getting these power sets keep getting bigger. Well, is there like with finite sets? S has three elements, its cardinality is three. Its power set has cardinality two to the third, which is eight. So its power set of the power set of S would have cardinality two to the eighth. 256. The next one, the power set of the power set of the power set of S would have cardinality two to the 256 power. With an infinite set, if S has an infinite cardinality, its power set has a greater infinite cardinality. Whatever that might mean. What it means really is there's no one-to-one -one and onto function from S to its power set. The proof of it is actually surprisingly easy. Such a deep thing. It's a contradiction. I'm not going to write it out in sentences, but let's think about the idea. Assume the contrary that there is a one-to-one -one and onto function from a set to its power set. I'm not writing things out, I'm just saying them. Assume to the contrary that there's a one-to-one -one and onto function from a set to its power set. How do you get a contradiction? I'm going to create a set A that can't possibly be in the image of S. I'm pretending it's in the image because I'm pretending the function is only one I want to. Let A be the set of all elements in S such that X is not an element of F of X, which looks kind of strange. But remember, if I'm mapping a function to its power set, the outputs are going to be subsets of the original set. So writing something like this is not crazy. Consider that the sum of all elements in S, and then put an S here, that are not elements of the image of that point under F. This is a set. The question, OK, I'm assuming that this is 1 to 1 and on to. I'm assuming that A is in here. A being in this um, image of S under F, what would that mean? Use this kind of notation in algebraic. This is the set of all points that are in here that are images of points in here that get mapped to. Set of all things that, that S maps to over here. I'm assuming it's onto here, so I'm assuming that this set is in there. That would mean there exists an X in S such that F of X equals A. But I claim that's essentially a contradiction. Because the question now is, um,
What is the question? Here's where it gets confusing. This is relatively easy when you think about it in the right way, but I'm all of a sudden confused here. There's a contradiction to this statement here. Um, but to, how does that contradiction go? I was thinking about it before class it was clear. If X is in A, that would mean, since A is f of X, that X is in f of X. Can you see this down there? Mm -hmm. Well, what, that, what would that mean? That would mean X is not in A. There's the contradiction. Because A consists of all elements of S that are not in the image of themselves under F. By definition, this would mean X is not an A. And you can go the other way, too. If X is not an A, just write the arrows the other, the other way. If X is not an A, by definition, that means X um, is in F of X. In other words, F of X is an A. So either way you go, you get this contradiction that X being an A implies X is not an A, and X is not an A implies X must be an A. Super confusing at times, but then sometimes it's like, well, obviously. It's just weird that way. That's a contradiction, so this can't be an object function. Any function like this can't be onto. I assume it's onto, I get a contradiction. So the power sets keep getting bigger, even if you start with an infinite set. So you can keep taking power sets over and over again and keep getting bigger and bigger sizes of infinity. There are infinitely many sizes of infinity. You might want, here's another question. What's the cardinality of the set of sizes of infinity? I don't know the answer to that. But what's the ultimate paradox? I phrased it last time as <coughs> consider the set of all sets. Everything is in this set. All numbers, all letters, all people, all things, all ideas, all atoms, all... Name something, it's in the set. Okay? Evidently, then it's got to contain itself because it contains everything. But how can a set contain itself? It's a paradox. Actually, that's more often written in a different form. It's called Russell's paradox. Russell's paradox. Um, consider the set. Of all things that are not elements of themselves, which you think would be everything, but considering that collection, if such a thing existed, you get a contradiction. Because if you had a set that was an element of itself, then by definition it would not be in the set, it would not be an element of itself. And if you said it was not an element of itself, by definition it would have to be in itself, by the definition of set. The more down-to-earth phrasing of this, consider the set of all barbers who uh, only shave those people who do not shave themselves. Does the barber shave himself? If he doesn't shave himself, then he's got to shave himself. But if he does shave himself, then by definition he's got to not shave himself. The barber shaves only those people who do not shave themselves. Is a classical way it's, it's phrased. Okay? So what's the, well, how, do you, how do you fix this paradox? The fix is to not do naive set theory. There's even a Wikipedia page about naive set theory. Naive set theory. Naive set theory. Huh? This idea that sets are just collections of things, 
leads to these paradoxes. So you gotta fix it somehow, and that's axiomatic set theory. They're more basic axioms than sets just being collections of things. Again, these things are good to know about, to be aware of their existence as a math major, not that you necessarily have to study them. Okay. But, you know, if you're at a cocktail party 30 years from now, and somebody says, you know, what do you think about Russell's paradox? You're a math major. <laughs> you should at least say, I, yeah, I remember hearing about that one time. It blew my mind. <laughs> All right, we should get back to real analysis here now. Um, I'm going to do section 1.5 in about two minutes here. You should study it over the course of maybe a couple hours. Okay? Section 1.5 has got two goals. is to make some important definitions that we'll use later on, and also consider some examples of um, functions and how they might be defined. Examples of the definitions include uh, what does it mean for a function to be increasing? over an interval. Actually, actually very important for us, and we will use it later. What well, does it mean to be strictly increasing over that same interval? Decreasing. Monotone. What does it mean to be a maximum value of a function over an interval? Those are all things you kind of know intuitively, but if you're going to prove things related to them, you need to know it rigorously. Section 1.5. It also gets into definitions for what are called transcendental functions, which sounds like it might be difficult. And the definitions and proving things from them can be, but there are functions you're used to. Sine, cosine, e to the x, natural log of x, arc sine of x. Essentially, what you know about those functions from calculus is going to be good enough for us. Some calculus books are called calculus with early transcendentals, meaning those functions occur early in the book because they're useful. You learn about them in pre-calc, why should you wait until half, half the way through the year for them in calculus to show up? Our book tell, is essentially the same approach. You might even call it real analysis with early transcendentals. Okay? You are going to have at your disposal, like you did for today's homework if you used the arctangent function, uh, that one problem. Um, at your disposal, knowledge about trig functions, exponential functions, algorithms. We're not going to try to prove facts about those things from scratch. If we were, we'd take them to chapter 7, perhaps. We don't want to wait that long. Okay, so this is real analysis with early transcendentals. And that's all I want to say, actually, about section 1.5. You should not ignore it. You should definitely study it, think about it. There are some problems. I want to move on to chapter two, though, in our remaining, um, oh, I guess we have a window of five to 10 minutes here, 15, five to 15 minutes. Okay, I'll shoot for 10 minutes more, okay? Chapter two gets into sequences. You've learned about sequences before. Count two, do sequences, maybe even in Middle school, you learn about sequences, looking for patterns in your numbers, that kind of thing. What is a sequence? Informally speaking, A sequence of real numbers. Okay, that's the implicit assumption. I'm not going to write that down. Is just an infinite list. X1, X2, X3, X4, etc. Such an infinite list is different than a set of numbers from that list. 
These are going to be numbers for us. But there's a specific ordering to them. That is an important distinction between the sequence itself and the set of values in the sequence. It's not a set. Okay. More formally, or maybe I should just say formally, formally, a sequence is a function. It's a sequence of real numbers from the natural numbers to the reals. For each natural number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc., there is an output. x sub 1 is the output for the natural number 1. x sub 2 is the output for the natural number 2 x sub 3 is the output for the natural number 3, etc. And maybe I could call this more formally because if I wanted to be even more formal, I'd describe functions in terms of sets, like in my preliminary handout. Functions are really sets. If you want to go back to set theory, even just naive set theory. We won't. We won't go there. A sequence is a function. Our book typically writes the sequence um, consisting of this infinite list, x1, x2, x3, x4, etc., in the following notation, like that. I think that is a bit confusing because it does make you think. It, it could confuse you in two ways. It could make you think a sequence is a set our book uses the set builder notation, or the, I should say the braces, the curvy braces. It can also make you think, think the sequence just has one number in it. One value, you might say. Those are both misunderstandings of this notation. Perhaps a better notation would be to use parentheses instead of curvy braces like that. But even that's not perfect. Why is that perhaps better? Well, an even better notation might be used parentheses with all the numbers listed out because what that would emphasize is you could think of a sequence as an infinite vector, an infinite dimensional vector if you like. The order is important though. Okay, there's a natural order in here, x1, x2, x3, etc. We will use the book's notation for sequences, but, and while it's somewhat standard, it's not ideal because it can lead to confusion. How do you define sequences? Two relatively easy ways, and then there are harder ways. Um, you can have what you might call a direct formula. X sub n equals 2 to the n over n factorial, for example. That's a formula that defines a sequence. Okay? Technically speaking, x sub n represents the output of the sequence at the integer of the natural number n. The sequences are functions. So this is just a formula. The sequence itself, in our book's notation, you want to put the curvy braces around it. That represents the entire function, the entire sequence. We will sometimes be okay with just listing the outputs of the sequence out with dot, dot, dot. We'll be okay with that sometimes if we're going to do that in this case. It is also an implicit assumption that you start n at 1, though that's not always the case. Sometimes you might want to start n at 2 or 3 or 4 or even negative 5. And so in those kind of cases, technically speaking, the function doesn't have to be on this domain. It could be on a modified domain, a subset of z that goes on forever to the right but not the left. 
If you're going to list it out, starting at n equals 1, you have 2 to the first over 1 factorial would be 2. 2 to the second over 2 factorial would be 4 over 2 is 2. 2 to the third, 8 over 3 factorial. 3 factorial sixth is 8 sixths or 4 thirds. So I'm simplifying these numbers. 2 to the fourth is 16 divided by 4 factorial. 16 divided by 24 is what? 2 thirds? Do one more. 2 to the fifth is 32 divided by 5 factorial, which is 120. 32 over 120 is 16 over 60 is 8 over 30 is 4 over 15. There are the first one, two, three, four, five terms of the sequence, you might say. The first five outputs of the sequence of the function like this. And I think what I'll do to end class today is write down our toughest definition from this list of definitions. What does it mean to be bounded? What does it mean to be monotone? What does it mean to converge? Let's spend a few minutes writing down and thinking about it briefly the definition of what it means for a sequence to converge, have a limit. A sequence. Xn, do make a habit of putting the curvy braces like the book does. You're talking about the sequence as a function, really, rather than the output of a sequence at a number n. If you don't put the curvy braces, then you're not really talking about the sequence. Converges to L. Again, the implicit assumption in everything we do here is that these are real numbers. This is a sequence of real numbers, L is a real number. If what? Think about an example to help us here. The sequence whose terms are 1 over n. If you list it out as 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth, 1 sixth, 1 seventh, 1 eighth, getting closer and closer to 0, seems like the limit of this should be 0. And in fact, that's true. What does it really mean for the limit to be zero? It really means you can get as close to zero if you like by making n sufficiently large. If for all epsilon greater than zero, our measure of closeness, I can get within epsilon of L by taking n sufficiently large. There exists a capital N in the natural numbers such that the distance between the output of the sequence at the input N, Xn, and L is less than epsilon for all little n greater than or equal to capital N. In this blizzard of symbols, you need to get meaning out of it. Epsilon is the measure of closeness. Epsilon can be any positive number, though we, in, we intuitively think of it as being small. Maybe even really small, 10 to the negative million. There exists a capital N that might be very big, 10 to the positive million. So that I get within epsilon of L, the distance between Xn and L is less than epsilon as long as this little n is bigger than or equal to capital. That's the definition of what it means for the sequence to converge to L. This is the definition you need in proofs. At least the simplest case is where a sequence can be proven to converge. Or not converge maybe to L at least. We might negate this definition to prove a sequence doesn't converge to L. It might not converge at all or it might converge to some other number. Or we might negate this to prove the sequence does not converge to some number L. Starting next Monday, we will be using this in earnest to be doing real, you might say real, real analysis proofs, okay? Getting into the real nitty gritty of the subject. Have a good weekend.